Good evening, everyone. Lights, camera, that's great. <laughs> um, so, welcome. My name is uh, Geneviève Rail. I'm the principal of the Simone de Beauvoir Institute, and uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight with you. Je suis très heureuse d'être votre maîtresse de cérémonie. Est-ce que vous aimez ce petit nom, la maîtresse? C'est bon, hein? Surtout pour une principale comme moi. Um, donc, je serai votre maîtresse de cérémonie ce soir euh, pour la quatrième et dernière activité euh, de la 20e saison consécutive de cette série de conférences. So, welcome to students, staff, uh, faculty, of course, uh, members of the community at large, uh, to the last event of the 20th consecutive season of the Concordia University Community Lecture Series on HIV AIDS. So we're really, really delighted um, to offer tonight's unique event, Curlews and Condoms, Grassroots Prevention Then and Now, as a collaboration between the Simone de Beauvoir Institute and uh, the lecture series on HIV AIDS. Um, and, oh, I forgot, and the Fine Arts Students Alliance. I think they're a crucial part in all of this, so I want to acknowledge their contributions. D'abord, nous sommes très honorés d'accueillir euh, le président de l'Université Concordia ce soir. Alors, euh, on m'a demandé d'être très brève. Il m'a demandé d'être très brève. Donc, tout de suite, I would like to invite Dr. Alan Shepard, President and Vice Chancellor of Concordia University, to say a few words. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I, first I wanted to just compliment the organizers of this series for the series of speakers you've had this year. It started back in October with uh, uh, Dr. Jacques Pepin uh, from the Université de Sherbrooke on the origins of uh, HIV. Then Jim Hubbard, a filmmaker, was here in November for uh, a project on ACT UP. Then we had Mia Donovan and Lara Rocks here um, in January for a screening of the film Inside Lara Rocks, a lecture about porn and prevention, hype and hope. And tonight we have Diana Diana, a uh, community educator and hairdresser from Columbia, South Carolina, Curlers and Condoms, Grassroots Prevention, Then and Now. Had I known about the first three, I would have tried to make them and I would have tried to be here tonight. Unfortunately, I'm going to dinner with a potential donor to the university, so those of you in the community want me to go to that dinner. Um, Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay for the talk. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so, as I understand it, Diana started her work in 1986 and handing out condoms in her hair salon. And it's a little difficult sitting in Montreal in the year 2013 to really appreciate what a radical act that would have been. Doesn't seem like a radical act necessarily in 2013 in Montreal but I am pretty sure it was a pretty shocking thing and I'll bet tongues were wagging, I'll bet Diana was the talk of the town for this radical act, a radical political act. I would have some sense of it because in 1986 I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, just up the road a bit from South Carolina uh, where I was a member of the Lesbian and Gay Student Union and eventually its president, which shocked my parents to no end. Um, it was a surprise for everybody. Um, um, where we were handing out free condoms uh, on the campus of the University of Virginia in the, in the 1980s as uh, the HIV epidemic was really full and fully underway. Um, it's hard to appreciate, again, what it was like in, at UVA in the 1980s handing out free condoms. Uh, lots of people wanted them. Uh, they didn't want to be seen taking them. So there was all this kind of surreptitious kind of, you know, when nobody was looking, come by and grab a handful. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, uh, we're honored that you, that you came to share your story with us. And uh, it's great to see so many people in the audience who want to hear about it. And uh, I wish you all the best and safe travels. And Jen, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck. I, I hope you do bring a lot of money. And then when you get it, you think about us uh, and the lecture series. <laughs> But uh, it was very nice to, uh, to have you, Dr. Shepard. Um, and uh, we know your support for these kinds of causes, so it's, it's uh, definitely um, heartwarming. 
For two decades, the Concordia HIV AIDS lecture series has proven to be a powerful tool in aiding in the sensitization of our local communities, um, sparking also the collaboration of academia and society at large. Notre mission a été de conscientiser les gens au sujet des aspects sociaux, scientifiques et culturels de la pandémie par le biais de l'éducation populaire au sein de la communauté, mais aussi le dialogue, la critique sociale et la promotion du travail des bénévoles et bien sûr de l'activisme en général. We want to encourage the next generation of AIDS activists, researchers and teachers in the field of HIV AIDS. I'll be brief because I know I'm sort of between you and the, the better part of this program. Um, but uh, just a few additional acknowledgements I think are in order. We'd like to thank the sponsors who've made this lecture series possible. Uh, the principal sponsors, so Viv, uh, Viv Healthcare in partnership with uh, Shire Biochem, the Gilead Sciences, the President's Office at Concordia University, the Office of the Vice President, Research and Graduate Studies, and also a number of Concordia University departments, uh, communications, cinema, religion, sociology and anthropology, uh, the Dean of Fine Arts, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, the Fine Arts Students Alliance, and of course my own Simone de Beauvoir Institute. Friends also of the lecture series, so the Black Community Resource Center, the Canadian AIDS Treatment Information Exchange, the Canadian Legal AIDS Network, the Farah Foundation, the uh, AIDS Communi Community Care Montreal, Réseau et Culture de Témoignage. So just a few words about the evening so you know a bit what's coming up. So first our invited uh, lecturer, Diana, will say a few words to introduce the video, Diana's Hair Ego, made by Ellen Spiro in 1991, and that's gonna be about 30 minutes. Ensuite, uh, Diana va revenir ici au podium pour faire de brefs commentaires et recevoir vos questions. Uh, on va accorder entre 30 minutes et 45 minutes pour uh, cette portion du programme. Um, just a, a few little uh, r rules, I guess. We would like to, for the question period to speak into one of the two wandering microphones, so we'll, um, we'll circulate those in the audience. Um, vous pouvez poser vos questions, évidemment, en anglais, mais bien sûr en français aussi, et uh, il y aura toujours des gens autour uh, pour nous aider à, à, à traduire pour vous, si ce n'est pas possible. Uh, les téléphones cellulaires à off, cell phones off, please. Um, et aussi, vous avez probablement vu à l'entrée, you've seen at the entrance that uh, donations are appreciated and will help with the uh, uh, AIDS uh, HIV project, but also with Cinema Politica. I now have the pleasure of inviting Janice Dale. She's an arts professional and journalist, community activist, a member of Global Network of People Living with HIV for North America, to say a few words of welcome and to present Diana to you. So, Janice. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jen. I was looking up here and saying, I, wonder, I hope one of these two um, pieces of contraption was a light <laughs> because my eyes are failing me, but these are working well and my letters are big. Um, I'm honored, I'm honored to be uh, a, a part of this milestone edition of the Concordia series, 20 years, and I congratulate Dr. Baugh and uh, Jen, of course, and all the, f the, the founders and all the contributors throughout these 20 long years. It is a pleasure, a great pleasure to be part of this fabulous lecture series and overall Concordia HIV AIDS project with its commitment to developing awareness within this region of Quebec of all the issues around HIV and AIDS. I am really, really honored to have been invited. So you know my world is full of time constraints. And when I saw on the itinerary that I had five minutes to do this presentation, I was like, whoa, that's a surprise bonus because that is a lot of airtime. <laughs> so I thought, since the infection rate amongst people um, in the African, Caribbean, and black communities in Canada is estimated to be 8.5 times higher than among other Canadians in 2008, I should take the time to talk about Shabak, 
Shabak is the acronym for the newly formed Canadian HIV AIDS Black, African, and Caribbean Network that came together in recent years after assessments and research enlightened the community to the disproportionate numbers of new HIV infections and prevalence in Canada's ACB, which is the new acronym for African, Caribbean, and Black. We want to make sure everyone's included here in Canada, communities, okay? And um, so then I thought five minutes would really not ever give Shabbat justice at all because Shabak has a huge wide vision to end the HIV epidemic among ACB populations in Canada. And it has a mission to work to strengthen the response to HIV AIDS epidemics and associated stigma and discrimination among ACB communities in Canada. So the information that I would need to share would take as long as a lecture. And tonight, I'm not the one. Well, I do want to let you know, however, a bit about myself, though and why Diana and all the HIV AIDS related activities that she has steeped herself in mean so very much to me. It is because about the time when Diana recognized the need for HIV AIDS education and widespread awareness within the black communities in her region of the United States, I was living in Canada had gotten together with a fabulous beau around 19, 89, who was HIV positive, and that was unknown to both of us. We got married, he passed away, I tested positive, and my life has never been the same. In reflecting, I realized that HIV AIDS prevention was not on my radar at all, not you know, anywhere close to what I was thinking. Um, you know, I wasn't thinking HIV even affected black community members. And unfortunately, the subject of HIV AIDS is still widely considered irrelevant in the ACB communities in this, our Montreal region, not to mention the rest of Canada, but I can, I can speak with authority about this region. The attitude remains, it's about them and not us. There is a federal initiative to address these issues of HIV AIDS among what the government terms as people from countries where HIV is endemic in Africa and the Caribbean. But as Diana perhaps also experienced, it is community-driven initiatives that are often more effective and ultimately most important, right, even as they complement the government initiatives. So Shabak is around, hallelujah for that, and I will, I will be able to um, let anyone who wants to know more information about Shabak, I have a, um, a link for, for the, the website if anyone wants to ask me for that. But without further ado, I want to place the spotlight right now on Diana. Diana is an African-American South Carolina-based grassroots prevention activist and hairstylist who became the subject of the American documentary film Diana's Hair Eagle in 1991. She was one of the early pioneers of AIDS education, having begun prevention work in her salon in 1986 by handing out condoms to her clients, soon after which she founded the nonprofit South Carolina AIDS Education Network. In 1989, Diana joined forces with ACT UP to stage a state house rally for the rights of people with HIV AIDS. A filmmaker borrowed footage from the rally and from Diana's salon to make the short film Diana's Hair Ego, which has honored both the, uh, both, which has honored both, I think it's, which has been honored. I'm also an English teacher. <laughs> so I was sent this little part. <laughs> All right, which, <laughs> where am I? I'm so sorry to be reading so uh, fervently. It's because I have so much in my head, you know, and I, I, you know, I just prefer to read than to make a lot of mistakes. Okay, okay. So it, which has been honored both by the American Film Institute and internationally. 
Opening with a screening of this epoch epochal short video, Diana will reflect on her experiences as a prevention activist and safer sex educator, examine the impact of grassroots organizations, and speak about her current work within the community. And I'd love to welcome to Concordia Lecture Series, Diana. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all very much for having me here. Um, people, <laughs> everybody has been very, very nice. The friendliest place I've probably ever been. Um, <laughs> most welcome. Good food, we've been working on that too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I decided not to give any kind of particular speech. I think it'd be best to just watch the video and then do question and answers and maybe I can get to the point instead of just babbling on about things. I've uh, been in the hair business for 50 years now, and I've had my salon for 37 years. And again, in 1986, I started giving out the condoms and the AIDS information from a magazine that I found about a woman who got infected from her boyfriend that she didn't know anything about AIDS. And that's when I realized that nobody in the salon was talking about it, so maybe nobody else knew about it either. And I ordered materials, and I bought the first 5,000 condoms, and nobody would take them and I had to wrap them up as little gift wrap packages because nobody wanted to be found out about having an actual condom in their pocketbook. So the story goes on from there. Um, could we start the video? Thank you. At that time, it was just a lot of flyers and brochures and me passing the word on of what I had read If I because I didn't have any money to Xerox a lot of things. So I would read whatever it was and just verbally pass it on from client to client. And the clients took the information well, they were interested, most of them were surprised, and I think most of them didn't have any idea of what AIDS was or how bad it was, or the fact that they were in any kind of risk at all. And I thought that if it was anything important, the customers would have known about it if it was important. But then, it, to me, it seemed very important, and nobody knew about it, which made it sound even more important. Okay, I guess you have to prepare your questions, and I'm gonna right away give the microphone to Diana. Thank you so much for this uh, video, congratulations, and uh, here it is. Thank you, everybody. For running. Hi, thank you for that, I really enjoyed it. Hi, good. My question is, is the State Carolina AIDS Education Network still operating? No, it isn't. Uh, it was running about, for me, about $8,000 a year out of pocket, and it was very hard to get grants. They would give me a 24-hour notice to get and complete a grant that other people were getting three months' notice for, and that's been going on for years and years. So I still give out condoms in the salon. I still had have AIDS ed education materials there, and my friend Bambi has her own organization now, and I still assist her with her organization. So some things change and moved around, and I'm almost back where I started. Did you face any discrimination from within the community as you were doing this project? Because mostly we saw like an overwhelmingly positive uh, atmosphere. Uh, the people in the community were very nice and very supportive. That's the only way I could have made it all those years that I did that. It was just the government agencies that were uh, giving out a hard time. Um, it was the community was really good. I had some people that were talking about me and saying that I probably have AIDS or I know a bunch of people have AIDS. And actually, when I started, I didn't know anybody that had it, but I knew I would someday. Thanks very much for the film. That was wonderful. I was uh, just wondering, what are your kind of perceptions of the progress that's been made so far, specifically kind of from your contribution to the contributions of other grassroots organizations now? I've heard from a lot of agencies over the years 
Um, and they've made a lot of progress, and I've got letters from people years ago that said that they saw the film and decided if I can do that as one person, that they could do it. So some of them started in their beauty salons, and we had a program for hairdressers, barbers, tanning salons, and we actually had a contest, whoever could decorate their salon with the most AIDS education information and give out condoms. We gave them a, a great big trophy that they were very proudly displayed to a, a barber shop around the corner, won the contest. I had 38 salons participating in that. Um, other people have decided to open up organizations and they've been back in touch with me and they said if I could do it, they could do it. And I said the only thing I want you to do is do it better. Um, I love your jewelry. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I was also wondering, just from your perspective, why do you think that the epidemic continues to persist in the black community? And how do you think that um, like, uh, prevention has changed, I guess, or needs to change from 1986 and 1991 to now? Actually, from, uh, from what I can see, it hasn't changed that much from 1986. Uh, people in the black community, especially the, um, the men, gay men who won't come out and women who are in denial. They've got women who still don't want the men to wear condoms because it, um, they think that somebody might be cheating on somebody just because they produce a condom, just because they show one. There's still a lot of problems with that. And in the black community, nobody has, nobody's gay and they don't have to worry about anything. Nothing changed, and they still don't want to talk about it in the churches, in the black churches in, in South Carolina. Some do, I don't mean all, not all of anybody, but a lot of people still hold people back. And in the small communities where they only have a church to go to, it's their only other activity other than, I don't know if you have a Walmart here, but other than going shopping, uh, <laughs> going to the store, going to work, they go to church. And if you don't get your AIDS education information from one of those places or come to my salon, it's going to be kind of hard. So a lot of things didn't change because people wouldn't change, and they still haven't. They're still in denial. And as long as they are, the epidemic is going to continue. And our community, South Carolina, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, has risen quite high nationally. So nothing really changed, unfortunately. Hi, Diana. Um, Hi. I just needed to ask a question following up from our conversation last week on, on that note. You mentioned that one of the difficulties you had um, in convincing a very Bible Belt community to even talk about AIDS was a term that you used called the plantation mentality. And um, I wanted to ask you if you could explain that because the the kind of influence both of the church and of silencing about sexuality seemed pretty related to how hard the work was that you were doing. It's, to me, it was always some kind of slightly connected, I suppose, because people were doing things like from the movie Color Purple, and I was, I guess everybody heard of that, Oprah's movie. Um, <laughs> they were still talking about things from years ago and they were still listening to what their great grandmother said and somebody old in the family. And if you don't talk about, nobody was talking about sex, of course, because nobody was having sex, even though the church populations were getting larger. <laughs> but <laughs> nobody was doing anything with anybody. So that was a problem that they didn't advance. I still have people that if they didn't say it in the church, then it didn't happen. If the minister says a certain thing, that's it. You don't even discuss it. There, there is nothing else. So if you have a minister who uh, wouldn't let people be buried or have any ceremonies in their church because they may be gay or may be HIV positive, I found that to be a problem because it, it didn't have to be like that. It never should have been like that. But it still is like that. You know, they're opening up a little bit more, but not like it should be. And the mentality is do what I was told. Do what you were told. Back on the day in the plantation, this is what it was, and you just did what you were told. And even though they're, you know, they're, in fact, the poster that was in the, um, in the movie, Bound by the Chains of Ignorance, and we had, um, this is one of our kids did that, the artwork, by the way. Okay. And it was supposed to be a slave bound by the chains, and the chains was chains of ignorance, because they wouldn't let go. And I still have people. I have people last week 
that were still saying things to me that they should have moved on maybe 50 years ago, and they didn't, and they're gonna pass that on to their kids. And looking at that video, which I haven't watched in a long time, I recognize some of the people, and some of those people have already had kids and shouldn't have because they were, they were unmarried, they were not using any kind of type of protection, they were teenagers. That didn't have to happen like that, and I, I recognize some of them now because now I do their kids' hair. So I, I'm still seeing things that I shouldn't see, and I still had a lot of people used to come to me and, and ask for more information about um, AIDS stuff and when I tell their kids about it, but don't talk about sex or condoms. Mm. That's still a problem. Can, if I could just ask one more question. I just need to know, because the video is 20 some years old, um, if uh, Reginald Morton and William Denny are still alive? Uh, yes, Reggie was actually a student that I, if he had good grades, he could stay at my house for free. I had a couple of the students do that. Uh, Reggie got married, he's a minister, and he lives in a small town, Greenwood. Um, he's still doing that. And the other one, uh, he had a couple of kids <laughs> that he wasn't supposed to be having. He's not married, and he was just populating. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, um, that's really good. I uh, was really happy to see the film. And I'm, I know in, in Ottawa, there is a salon that um, models your, you know, that operates through your model, via your model. And I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned other people do as well. So I wonder if you follow up in terms of the material, the resources, you know, uh, I noticed there was a lot happening. Um, you train people. Is, is that something that you do in, with, with, you know, groups who want to, model this um, method? Well, I have, I have done that in the past. We had several different groups that, that Bambi and I had gotten together and, and started. And one was the AIDS Busters, a youth group. The kids had to be from 10 years old on through college. And we trained 793 people. It's an eight hour training program. And they had to be able to do basic AIDS 101. And then we would connect with their schools and tell the schools if their teachers weren't comfortable um, talking about AIDS, sex, or body parts that these children would. And we notified all the, the schools that we had all these kids available. So that was called the AIDS Buster Program. They designed a lot of the, the materials there, the drawings and sketches that the, the kids had done. And we said, um, I see, uh, we had one for hairdressers and barbers. And we had Mothers Against AIDS. I would show the videos. I think I've, I videotaped about 600 kids all together from ages third grade through college. And the thing that was interesting was that the kids in the third grade had the same questions that the kids had in college. That meant that none of the college kids got any information about AIDS education or sex education from all the way from third grade through college. And the kids in the third grade were pretty specific about some things that they had questions about that I was really surprised about. Really, really surprised. <laughs> they were really sp very graphic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you wouldn't expect a third girl. I, I kind of think they should be Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts at that age and size because they're cute and little. But they talk about all kinds of stuff, the same things that the high school kids did, the eighth grade, and the college. So we had different groups doing different things, but all of them had to go through an eight-hour training period. Uh, she would do AIDS 101, and I would make sure they were able to act out a lot of the, the, the situations that we put the kids in, and adults that we put them in. And then we started off with the uh, safe sex parties. Like uh, I think uh, one of the kids in the video was saying that uh, they wanted to learn more things that they could do that was safe since I told them all the things that was not very safe to do. So I started doing a um, safe sex party on stage. I've written a couple of plays too, and the kids at Allen University uh, perform my plays for a couple of years. So it was mostly the kids on stage. I had 23 kids in the play. And they would get up there and I had them do the first safe sex party on stage, which was completely harmless. And then I started doing um, something like a Tupperware party where people would have it in their house. So I got to some of my neighbors and they'd have parties in their house and they'd come in and they all, I did all the parties the same. The group of ministers were the same and the older people, younger people. And they all start off being stiff and sitting up in their chairs. And then 
in about 30 minutes, they're usually on the floor or doing something that they, you wouldn't expect them to do. And within the hour, they were usually completely wild. All the ministers were as wild as the kids in the high school and the colleges. All of them did the same thing. And then we shot a video that I made accessible to Jordan. <laughs> Party Safe with Diana and Bambi. Um, Ellen, the same girl that, that did this video, had us uh, do the safe sex party. She invited Bambi and I to go to New York to see the film, to see this film. And she said, after the film, we're gonna do a safe sex party. And I thought it would be a group, I usually don't do more than about 20, 25 people in a large group. And it was 250 people. And Bambi began to panic. So that's how we decided to do the safer sex game show. <laughs> So I picked a few people out of the, the audience and put them up on stage and they did the exact same thing. We had to make a few little modifications, but not very many. They did a safe sex party that was pretty wild. And then the people in California heard that the people in New York were really wild, so they wanted to outdo them. So they were the people that were um, actors, actresses, and acting a little bit wild. So we had a party there and that got kind of wild. And then the people in Chicago said, that they heard about the California and New York party, and they were more from the art world. And they had us uh, work in an art museum. They covered up all the artwork, and that was on World AIDS Day, um, a day without art. They covered all the artwork in the museum, and they hung giant eight-foot condoms from the ceiling, and we had a safe sex party there. And all those, those and the one in Toronto, that was pretty wild too. All of them were on the same uh, video that Jordan has. <laughs> and we get to learn from there that the kids can, and adults can all have a good time, but in all the different parts of the country, everybody acted and reacted exactly the same way. Some of them got a little wilder depending on what they were trying to impress me with, whether it's their artwork background or their, their acting background. And they acted, and a lot of them, and the first one was from the New York group, the ACT UP group. A lot of them were in the audience. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with ACT UP, and they did. <laughs> Uh, the end of the film ends with a, sort of a su suggestion that people should make donations because of the difficulty in getting funding. Um, did, did that actually happen? Did, did you see an influx of donations? Or, or I guess I'm asking more broadly how the, the video actually impacted the work that you do. Well, uh, the video was um, shot by Ellen. She sent the video out and it won the American Film Festival Award, I think, in. I think it was 1991 or so, uh, that she won the award, and there's 11 other awards around the country. I've got a few donations from people way back then, but it wasn't a lot, because a lot of people, were, uh, the people that were really concerned were also trying to start their own organizations, but they gave me a lot of information, and I offered them, anybody who wanted to take anything that I had, take it, do it better, make it better, share the information. We didn't get any money out of it. The film. Um, cleared a, a lot of money, but it, it wasn't to me. They gave me about 50 copies of that video and told me that I could uh, sell them and do whatever I wanted to. But meanwhile, it's gone all over the world, but it, it didn't go in my pocket. <laughs> so no, no money. It was still coming out of my pocket for the most part. Um, donations might be $10, $20 once in a while, but it, you have to buy condoms in the packages of thousands. So it, it didn't do a whole lot. It was just a really good idea. I never thought the video was going to do anything because she said she just wanted to interview a few of my friends and she said, she called me and she said, I made a video and, and they kind of liked it out in Hollywood. You want to go to Hollywood and, and get this award with me? And I said, yes. So I went. Because <laughs> I paid all the expenses and everything. It was really nice. And I got to be on stage. They showed the video and the audience was filled with uh, directors and producers. They were all very friendly and very nice. And they said that it was the first time that uh, anybody got three standing ovations in over 20 years. So it goes into the, the video archives. It's a documentary film, so it's not like a regular movie, but it's still gonna be in the, um, the documentaries section of the archives. 
Uh, hi, I'm, I'm black, I'm gay, and I'm here in Montreal, I'm out. I want what? to know... <laughs> I want to know how it is easy to, to in your organization in uh, South Carolina and if you offer a space for people who, who come out and how, what's the process like is it in, in your area? In South Carolina, what's the process of the people coming out that are black and gay? Is there a, a place for people to come out? I think there's a, a couple of places in some of the colleges they may have a, um, a gay lesbian group. I'm not sure, though. I'm sure there won't be a lot of people in it because people are still in denial about what they are and what they do, mm. even though I've, I've done a lot of programs with a lot of, of gay men and women, mostly men, and I've gone into the universities at night and given condoms out to the guys, and I think it's still going to be hard because you can't really come out and then go to church Sunday and come back in again, you know? <laughs> It'd be a little bit difficult. Were you thinking of visiting? <laughs> <laughs> I'll still welcome you. <laughs> um, in the, oh my God, it's loud. Um, in the community, where there are a lot of people, because you said when you started you didn't know anyone who had AIDS, but then I'm sure people did get infected. So how did that change things? Like were they, you know, like you talked about the quarantine and stuff, but weren't there, you know, people who needed access to treatment and things like that? And because you know we saw the ACT UP video and they were like, and then we asked for pills, and then we asked for pills that didn't kill you, and then we asked for this. And so I was just wondering if treatment ever was part of like your activism work. No, I was doing AIDS education prevention, so everything I was focused on, because I didn't have any money to do anything as far as services, or medication was, you know, money was out of the question. Uh, the best I could do was make copies of things and create and design programs. So I did that around the country, different colleges and universities, and for the health department. So I did things for people, but I, I couldn't do the services. Bambi right now has her organization uh, HIV AIDS Council, and she is helping people to, to find jobs and has computer labs and things in her office, and she did become a doctor, and we still work together with that, but as far as those type of services, I wasn't equipped to do that, and because I'm not a doctor, I am just a hairdresser, so <laughs> they didn't give me a lot of credit for things. Um, you talked about how important that uh, church community is, especially in the more rural settings. Uh, do you notice uh, distinct differences between different churches, like be they AME or Baptist or whatever? Are certain groups more open to information? South Carolina has more churches than I've ever seen in, in one location. Uh, there's probably two or three every couple of blocks. Um, now I think they're all equally as closed-minded for the most part. Some of them are good, but when you tell somebody that's been going to your church and you know your kid dies and you, you can't even have the ceremony there at the church, I'm really not that impressed with them. I don't care what religion they are. And I've had parents that were so brainwashed by the ministers, they, they come in crying to me. I mean, call up. I had a hotline phone working in that office in the back, and they call up crying, and I don't know what I'm going to do with because my kid has, has AIDS, and I've got to kick him out the house now, and stupid stuff. You know, I just want to get rid of them because they've got AIDS and the minister said, and I said, you don't even have to finish the sentence really because I you know, kind of know what the minister said, that they won't let him in the church and they've convinced the families to kick him out of the house. I had a lot of people like that. It shouldn't even have been one, but I had a lot. So the church is not down on the church. I hope it didn't sound like that. <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> that <laughs> some people... <laughs> shouldn't be ministers, and <laughs> they shouldn't. And in South Carolina, you don't have to have, like, training. All you have to really have is a building and a cross and a pot to pass around for some money, and it's for a lot of them. I know more ministers who, who um, what do they call it, they were called. And I didn't know, understand what the word meant, called. It's like, called by who? Because I don't know who they're talking about. 
And they said, no, I was called. I was called to open up a church, and I was called to be a minister. And I was still working on call by who? Because you haven't gone to school for anything, and you haven't learned anything, and they make up their own religion, and then they want to speak in tongues that they whipped up over the weekend. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a little bit hard to deal with. And then those are the people that people look up to as their leaders. So I'm confused. Diana, um, you're so funny, and you're so <laughs> positive, and obviously there's a lot to be tired about, and there's a lot to be angry about at times, and so my question is just about what you do with that. So many years of so much work, and so much scarcity, and doors closing in your face, but you're, you're very positive, and very funny, and very light, and very approachable, and how do you keep that up? I don't go to funerals because <laughs> all my friends mostly have died. So I didn't go because if, if I went to all the funerals, I wouldn't have time to go to work anymore. So I don't have that many friends left. Uh, plus, I'm getting old, so you really don't have many you know, as you get older. So I just, I've got this nice husband here. He's really sweet. He's a lot of fun. He makes me laugh every day. <laughs> Just should have married him sooner, but we only met a few years ago. <laughs> so I was on my own. But I had those dogs that you saw in the movies. I always have dogs. Dogs don't cause any trouble at all. <laughs> They're fun. So I would just say thank you first, because I really love the idea behind what you've created. Um, my question is concerning prevention. Uh, you target a grassroots organization in a specific community, that of the black community, but there just seemed to be a lack of political manifestation. Um, ACT UP, in particular in New York and Paris, they, they decided to go about the idea of tackling the structural problems going on with the society, and you referred to it many times, the church, the government not giving you funding, and I was wondering, uh, did you try at all to get any political manifestations from the black community in South Car Carolina together to tackle the people who are leading the way and not conforming the education towards a manner that would prevent HIV transmission, and also the churches and those institutions that were preventing you from getting the funding and from getting the representation of your community within the larger uh, society. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And did you try to try to do that? Yep, <laughs> I did. <laughs> I, I tried really hard. When we had President Clinton, I was on the Presidential AIDS Council, and I did things with them, but then I had to go back to South Carolina, and I talked to some of our, our senators, our black senators, and people who are very, very political, and what they told me was, AIDS is too political. And they didn't want to talk about it. So I've been shut out of several offices, uh, uh, told that they just can't talk about it because it, it could affect their careers. And some of those people are still in, in office now, even though it's been all these years. They keep getting reelected somehow. Um, and when we had uh, President Bush, we, I guess you all know that was bad, um, <laughs> his, his father cut down on the uh, funding for AIDS. And then when the son got elected, little George, he was bad too. Um, I got a letter, an email from him I guess the first week or so he was in office saying he was dissolving the Presidential AIDS Council. I tried to send an email back, but I was blocked, so I don't know why. Um, so politically, I've tried. I've got lots of letters that I'm saving, and I'm sure somebody will find them interesting someday from all the different politicians and all the, the things that I've, I've tried to do. But sometimes they say that I didn't try hard enough, but. I was still just one person. I tried as much as I could, as hard as I could, and every single day. And even when you see the kids that were in the movies that were coming in and singing, I didn't have time for interviews. So they would come in and they'd interview while I was working. So I'm trying to interview them 
while I'm trying to do somebody's hair, while they're telling me about their, you know, the kid just died from AIDS, and then somebody else is telling me that he's got his girlfriend, you know, his girlfriend's pregnant and she's got AIDS, and what's he gonna tell his wife? And I'm trying to do all this at the same time, so it was a lot of juggling. And in between that, I was working with, attempting to work with the politicians. That amounted to, as you can see, zero. Uh, I got more, more positive results, even with the quarantine issue. Um, I had contacted the people in New York from ACT UP, and they sent me 142 attorneys came to town, and they were all dressed very casual, and they were just trying to decide, the, the sheriff's department was trying to decide what they were gonna do with them. They just said they were gonna arrest all of them. And that's when one of them said, fine, there's 142 of us. Your state will never get out of litigation, ever, ever. And then they said, well, never mind. We'll just process the way they normally would do large groups like they had it all the time. They had uh, nobody. But they had a little, like a little van, and they would process people in. Because ACT UP people come in. They plan to be arrested. They know how much the fine is. It was the most organized group of people ever. And I had a petition signed. I think I had about a few thousand names on the petition from clients and clients who would go out and get uh, signatures to request help from ACT UP because of the quarantine issue. People kept saying that they had friends and relatives quarantined and what was I gonna do about it? They didn't understand that I didn't have any power to do anything at all. But I did put those petitions together and I did get 142 nice people come down and that's how I met Ellen who did the filming and ended up with this video. So I did what I could but I just, that's about as political as I guess I got. Oh, but the people that worked um, you see, they did the rally downtown in front of our Capitol, and the people who signed the petitions who worked downtown were told they definitely could not go outside to uh, participate in the rally or do anything supportive, and if they saw them looking out the window showing support from the window, they'd be fired. So it, it was a little rough back those days. They did at least sign the petition, though. So I just tell me who hasn't asked a question yet, but... I don't know, I just needed to respond um, to the ignorance with which that question was asked because I think even a lot of ACT UP activists who are based in New York recognize that a lot of what they were able to do came from the fact that a lot of them didn't have to work full time and were white and had come from um, backgrounds of privilege and that furthermore, if you have to ask the question of whether distributing condoms to people who don't have them and who don't know that they are necessary is a political act, then you might have a lot more listening to do, whoever you are. Sorry. Uh -oh. <laughs> See, this is the nice Canadian way you ask the nasty question or comment and then you say, sorry. <laughs> we do that. At the Simone de Beauvoir Institute, sometimes we tease people, but it's very feminine. It's like we care about the people that we tease. Okay, uh, who is... Uh... Sorry. Thank you so much um, for your amazing work, Dana. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Um, I, I just found it so remarkable um, that you didn't know anybody who had AIDS when you decided to take this work up. Um, and I'm, so I'm wondering what motivated you, like what made you decide that this would be your life's work even though it didn't directly, wasn't directly affecting you at the time? I didn't think it'd take that long really. I figured common sense would mean that you'd use a condom so you don't get it because it's mostly spread that way. And if you're using needles, you should stop or you should bleach your needles. You, you should do things because it's preventable and people didn't prevent it. And the average person, the women in the salon, the, the young ones, the college ones, they would average about um, three weeks before they would have unprotected sex with somebody that they didn't know that well. And if they really were going all the way, they might average as long as three months before they would have unprotected sex. And then they would get the idea that as long as they had a test done, HIV test done, then they get the results and they're fine. 
So suppose you get the test done on, on Wednesday and you go out and you have unprotected sex with somebody you don't know very well on Saturday and then you're infected and then what? And then you go back to, you don't have to use condoms anymore because they pass that test that they still like to wave at people and say, hey, I got my test. Um, that's, a, that's a problem, I think. And I was working with the prostitutes at night in between everything else um, from around 12 till 2 in the morning giving out AIDS information and literature on how to get them off the street and some clothes, t-shirts, tote bags, food, things like that, but mostly condoms. So you got to kind of get to know them in the middle of the night. And then I started working with the men that were in, in line to go into to the rooms with certain prostitutes. And one of the guys I noticed had a wedding band on and I said, you want a condom? He said, I've been coming here for 10 years. I never thought about a condom. You know, you get a lot of people like that. And I looked and you know, a lot of other guys had bands on too. Then I hired some of the prostitutes to work with me to, to help out with the outreach so I would know where the other ones were to try to get to them. And it, it sort of snowballs a little bit. And one of the ladies that I work with said, I saw her out in front of her, her door and she's, she was waving a condom over her head, yelling at the guys, if you don't got one, you don't get none. <laughs> So it did pay off a little bit with some people. I mean, I don't know how much. It, maybe one person made a difference. And when I asked some of the um, prostitutes to work with me, they met with uh, one of the groups they had. It was called uh, Faces of Sisterhood. I was doing programs um, once a year. I'd have these programs going on, and <coughs> excuse me, the prostitutes would come out and they would explain that a lot of times their husbands, boyfriends, their men would come out and deal with them while they dropped the wives off at the church, they're with them. And then they, they would tell them what kind of things their men really like to do. And I think it surprised, I know it surprised them a whole lot because they didn't know that I had prostitutes in the same group with the rest of the respectable ladies. Um, oh. Sorry, it's <laughs> startling to hear your voice so loud. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really blown away and moved from seeing this. Thank um, you. I wanted to ask you if you could speak a little bit to the specificity of this information being shared in a hair salon. And um, I don't know if that's particularly relevant for you. What I mean is for me, the experience of getting my hair cut is really intimate and the way that information shared is, is particular in a salon. And so I just wondered if you could speak to that a bit. The way that the ladies would come in and tell me, they tell me all of their business. I know who they're sleeping with, what position they had last, I know everything. <laughs> so, and that, that's what it is with a lot of salons. I mean, a lot of hairdressers who are listening, you get to hear everything. So what I didn't hear was the fact that anybody was talking about condoms, and that's one of the things that I got started with. I didn't hear anything about protection. I did hear that somebody's having an affair and the husband doesn't know and all. I mean, I heard, heard everything else. So that's when I realized what I wasn't hearing. So when you listen to it, know that there must be some kind of a gap there. How can I, I'd be hearing everything else but not hearing things about safe sex, protection, AIDS, who has it, who doesn't. There's a lot of things that weren't there. So I decided I would, get more information. That's when I started passing out information in the salon. Um, you spoke to the fact that you feel that over time HIV transmission rates in certain communities hasn't necessarily gone down. But another big thing is um, the language in which we speak about HIV AIDS. And I was wondering if you feel that your community work is been able to shape that, particularly within your own community? Um, being able to, to make sure that the kids know the, the correct terms, I was talking about the, the children's group particularly, and as well as the adults, but the fact that they're not allowed to say vagina, penis, correct names of body parts, that does slow down things. You know, you're still talking about uh, don't touch the wee wee. You, you can't tell kids that. And then they have um, incest a lot in South Carolina, uh, we got child abuse, and the kids didn't know. I think I remember a story about um, about six or seven young girls, maybe fifth or sixth grade, 
they were going over to the bus driver's house with him and his wife had some horses in, in the, on their property and they could ride the horses. But to be able to ride the horse properly, you do have to ride the bus driver first. And they didn't know anything about that. They didn't know it was wrong until they learned it in school that that was sex. That was not practicing on how you ride a horse. And they didn't know. So things like that in the fifth grade, you don't know. Anybody else? Is it going too far? No. <laughs> um, you were talking about how people were afraid, or not necessarily afraid, but didn't want to go get tested for HIV. I was wondering how accessible these tests were in South Carolina. I was testing in the salon. I was doing the saliva test. Um, and I did get a, a mini donation from the Delta sorority. Uh, and it was about $500, and that was to be used for people to come in and get tested to help pay for the test. And Bambi also was testing at, at her place. And the problem was we get a lot of people that want to show, oh, let's see, I'm, I'm getting my tests, and see how good I am, I'm getting my tests. And they get all the tests done, and it costs about, about five or $600 to process the test properly back then. And then nobody would come in for the test results because they were afraid. So they wasted all that money, like 30 people getting tested, and none of them came back to find out the results. And I had uh, a few in the salon that they decided they didn't want to know. They wanted people to know they were getting tested, but they didn't want to know what the results were. Brilliant idea. Oh, I don't, I don't do testing in the salon anymore because the funding ran out for that. And I know Bambi was having a hard time with funding with her testing also, but now they're doing different types of tests. This was several years ago when they first started with the saliva test. Now they're doing the home, home kits. I guess they have them here too. The home testing kits, AIDS? No? Oh. Well, I guess the bad part would be if you test yourself at home and you have a false positive and you freak out on whoever you were with last, that would be bad, especially if you don't know and you haven't had any counseling, because I was against that years ago, but it, they're bringing it back. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm over here. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for the film, I really uh, appreciated it. I'm interested in teaching sexual education as well. Um, and uh, I was wondering how you feel about abstinence education in the United States and the funding, because I believe um, it's government funded, I think. Uh, I just wanted your view on that. Yeah, well, abstinence is a good idea. It's called Just Say No, and nobody's doing it. <laughs> 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 you know, they spend a lot of money on abstinence, and they, they don't give you a choice. I don't know if they have it here, but um, in our country, and in South Carolina, you have the choice, your parents have the choice of whether or not the kid can sit in through a AIDS education or a sex education. They don't give them that option with English and math, so I don't see the point. You know, they need to have it. I, was, I wanted it to be done from kindergarten, K through 12, just teach it like something regular so it wouldn't be the big forbidden, big quiet deal that nobody could talk about. You know, years later, you still haven't got a clue. And if you talked about it like you do with any other subject, it'd be just something normal. But they don't do that. They've got to keep it a secret. And everybody knows that nobody has sex until they're out of college. <laughs> they heard about that a lot. Anybody else? Hi, um, I just wanted to let you know that you did a great job and I think you're fabulous, but is there one thing you wish you would have done differently? Legally, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Whatever. <laughs> done differently. Uh, mm, no, I did the best I could. I did the best I could with what I had, considering I had to educate myself on the subject and come out of my own pocket on it. That's the best I could do. Um, I could say I could hit up more rich people, but I don't know any. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't matter. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have one more question? 
Nobody wants to be last. Oh, yes, one person wants to. Finally, somebody on this side. <laughs> We're going to end it on an optimistic note. Okay. So, um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'm also a hairdresser and AIDS activist, and I know hands down that the salon is the best place to do advocacy work. So, yeah, and any hairdressers in the house, you should uh, politicize your salons. But, um, no, it's amazing, you hear everything. But I wanted to know, because we've been talking a lot about kind of, let's say failures or things that haven't happened, but what are some of the successes that you've experienced, and they can be big or small, because sometimes they're just with one person. As far as uh, clients? Um, or in the work you've done. I think having the clients come up to me and thank me for talking to their kids about things or thank me for making condoms available to them, AIDS education, uh, making me keep my promises when they said, when one lady said, if you ever find out my husband cheating on me, would you tell me? And I've known her longer than her, her husband has known her. And I, I hinted around, and I finally ended up telling her. And she thanked me for that. Might be a little late, but she did thank me for that. But you've got um, people that just thank me for helping with their kids and sharing information. And the fact that after all these years have gone by, all you nice people had me come up here. So that was a good note for me. Thank you for remembering me. Thank you. Diana, Diana. <laughs> this is just one person and really giant, giant contribution. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I think all of us here are honored um, to have been able to listen to you and to see the video. Um, I'm really uh, touched, I guess, by uh, your commitment to the cause um, and this amazing uh, way that you've had your own personal touch and you know f of doing things, which I think is absolutely fabulous. And uh, I wish. Um, she could be on the current, uh, or the chief of the current advisory council, uh, not just for the US, but for just about anywhere on earth, because I think your approach is, is it, uh, and your frank way of talking about it, um, I think um, was uh, excellent for us. I think we have a lot to learn from your experience and yourself, so thank you, thank you so, so much. I have a few uh, final acknowledgements uh, to uh, Vive uh, Healthcare, Gilead Sciences, our principal sponsors, um, uh, the Fine Arts Student Alliance, Jason Millen for the graphic and web design, uh, CUTV for the video uh, footage and archiving of the event, um, and the HIV AIDS teaching team, uh, Professor Viviane Namaste, uh, who's right here with us. Um, her teaching assistant, Alex McClellan. I don't know if Alex is here. The internship uh, coordinators, Giselle Suzor Morin. Giselle is with us as well. Asher Fairstein for their work as um, a coordinator of the HIV AIDS lecture series. And uh, the work of four fabulous uh, interns, uh, Tatiana Fillin. Stephanie uh, Arben, Stefan Bridges, and Anissa giro birkin Thank you so much to these four individuals. And of course, um, my friend and uh, wonderful director and founder of the Concordia HIV AIDS Project, 
Dr. Tom Waugh. Yeah. Um, I have, before I, I, I leave you, I have uh, one invitation is for you to kindly donate um, to the project. There's boxes as you get out, and so as we've learned from Diana, um, donations are not always there, but they're very important, I guess, for these uh, lecture series to go on. Um, and uh, in exchange, <laughs> we're, we're also uh, giving you something, of course, this wonderful lecture, but we're also inviting you all to join us at the 11th floor of the EV building. So you just go 11 and you're going to be there with us. There's a reception um, to uh, welcome and honor I guess, um, Diana for um, her uh, work and um, to celebrate the 20 years of the lecture series. And so donate and come and have a drink with us on the 11th floor of the EV building. Thank you. project um, out of the fine arts department here, faculty here. Um, it really occurred to me that um, having a lecture series about HIV and AIDS is actually something very different um, from many of the ways that HIV and AIDS are talked about and owned and used. And by that I mean academically, in medical research, blog posts, the media, conferences, very well-funded conferences, very poorly funded conferences. There's a lot of ways in which HIV is being expressed and talked about, and there's something that I find really special about this lecture series that is not like any of those things. And I was reminded about how in 2001, um, this was six, uh, five years before I was diagnosed HIV positive, um, I sat in the front row to see my personal Canadian dance hero, Marky Gillis, um, give her presentation, Dance versus HIV, Art, Politics, and Audience. Um, and I was never really the same since, um, as is often the case after you see one of Marky Gillis' performances of any kind. Um, she talked about her brother Paul Gillis' death in 1993 and the three pieces she made about him, Window of Loss, Torn Roots and Broken Branches, and The Heaven I Cannot See. And having just moved to Montreal, I, I'd only ever seen excerpts of these things on a CBC program called Adrian Clarkson Presents, and the idea of being that close to um, a part of my Canadian heritage had never really occurred to me. Um, but it wasn't until the Q&A um, that I saw that, in fact, this this, this strong dancer, this dancer who is known for being big or she was more built than you're supposed to be to be a dancer and she's always really had rad long hair and really political. Um, but it wasn't until the Q&A that it occurred to me she was in fact during her entire presentation she was barely holding it together. She had this stiff upper lip and she was actually quite cold and it really contrasted with how beautiful the, the videos of her, the dance pieces that she made um, in memoriam to her dead brother. Um, until the Q&A and the woman in the audience who identified as Mohawk went up to the mic and recited a poem to her that began with the words, I miss you. She recited the poem as a gift to Margi, um, an incantation of the emotions that this grieving sister could not speak. <coughs> that Gillis was doing all of this because she missed her brother, who had been taken away from her due to the social and governmental neglect of the AIDS crisis. Um, I cried for two hours that night, and then I cried again for many, many days, and it was a wound that was opened about so many things that it, I had to become very creative in order to know how to heal. Um, but I could go on, um, I could talk about the two-year period after getting my diagnosis that I didn't come to the lecture series, for example, um, because it was just 
too difficult. Um, and so the, for me, the anniversary of the lecture series um, should also be a time where we think about um, who is not present, who is not seen or felt as invited, who is not listening, and what people might not yet be able to bring themselves to think about HIV in the dry confines of a university auditorium on a Thursday night, or in the context of primarily white urban activism, as we witnessed this evening. Um, those uh, themes that this, uh, that this lecture series have brought out and enabled people to dialogue with is something that I find a tremendously powerful part of what it does. Um, and so, um, before I go on to introduce the um, series, the lecture series founder, um, Tom Wa, and the current um, research chair, Vivian, um, I wanted to say I'll, I'll also be in keeping with the lecture series rather famous openness and community spirit. I invited a few of um, the allies and friends from the HIV um, AIDS community in Montreal um, to speak about what they see as the possibility of significant HIV and AIDS responses to the pandemic over the next 20 years. So um, we're going to be hearing from um, Bruno Le Prat, um, Johnny Forever from ACCM, Nora Butler-Burke from the Action Santé Transsexuelle et Travestie du Québec, and hopefully Alexis Moussungania from the Festival Massimazie, briefly. But um, without further ado, I give you um, the founder of the HIV Age Lecture Series um, with Donald Boisvert, and his Professor Tom Wa, Director of the Concordia HIV AIDS Program. And uh, Tom, I hand it to you. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, we need to keep speeches to a minimum, so I won't talk for very long. Um, 20 years is a long time. Uh, there are people here who were probably born after the lecture series was founded in 1993, and that's very scary to me. Uh, and when we were planning this event, I told everyone we're not to use the word celebrate, we're, used, we're to use the word mark. It's a very somber occasion, the fact that we for 20 years have had to keep this lecture series going is a very somber uh, issue. However, the word celebrate kept creeping back into the discourse around tonight's reception, so there's nothing we can do, and it's, uh, it's important, I think, to acknowledge the and celebrate the tremendous energy uh, and effort that has gone into more than 80 events over the last 20 years, 80 speakers like Diana, who have come to Concordia to inspire us, to challenge us, and to uh, stimulate us with their example, with their ideas, with their, with their confrontations. Um, Diana talked about money a lot, and I, I just want to bring up money too. Um, we've had corporate sponsors throughout the whole 20 years, and sometimes this has been a little bit controversial. We've had a loyal corporate pharmaceutical uh, sponsor since the very beginning. Uh, Vive uh, uh, Healthcare with Shire. They used to be called 20 years ago Burroughs Welcome. And you saw Burroughs Welcome often targeted in the Act Up videos uh, that you've seen in the last event and previously on your own, I'm sure. Uh, I'm very grateful to Burroughs Welcome and the healthcare, all the same. They've been very loyal to us. They have never questioned the uh, lively criticism they have re received year after year after year from the speakers. Um, and uh, I think that uh, without them, we could not have carried this on for 20 years. They're not here, so I'm not just saying this to uh, butter up to them for another 20 years. I, I think it's an interesting example of a corporate academic activist relationship. So I just wanted to say that and where else the other sponsors were mentioned earlier in the evening. 
Um, also present tonight, there are many uh, former members and future, I hope also, of the teaching teams associated with the AIDS course over the years. Uh, and uh, there was a time in the late 1990s when some people thought we don't really need to continue this course. Uh, we don't need to continue the lecture series. The, we have uh, heart treatments, antiretrovirals of all kinds, and uh, in the West, in the Medicare uh, graced West, AIDS could, has, is sometimes described as a treatable chronic disease. What, what's the point of having a AIDS lecture series and not a tuberculosis lecture series and not a cancer lecture series? But uh, it has kept its own momentum, and I'm sure under uh, other leadership, it will be continuing for many years to come. Uh, it's, these 80 speakers have been a source of great inspiration to me. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that four of these 80 speakers are no longer with us. Um, Esther Valiquette, who spoke in the first year on video against the virus, uh, died in 1994. Eric Rofez, who spoke in 2001 on Dry Bones Breathe, Gay Male Post-AIDS Cultures, died in 2001. Laverne Monette, uh, who spoke in 2006 on Ignorance, Indifference, and Invisibility. Sounds like your talk, too, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, ignorance, Indifference, and Invisibility, the Aboriginal HIV AIDS Epidemic, died in 2006. And Winston Zulu, uh, the courageous Zambian activist who came in his wheelchair and spoke in 2008 on HIV and TB, <laughs> Southern Africa's fatal combination, died in 2008. Let's just take a moment of silence to remember these four speakers. Okay, so I think maybe I have exhausted uh, my time. This, these 20 years would not have been possible without the incredible contribution of people like Jordan and everyone else going back 20 years, students, staff, colleagues, uh, activists in the community, uh, professionals in the community, uh, AIDS community organizations. It was really a collective team effort and uh, we're all incredibly grateful to all of you for maintaining this energy and, and this momentum. So thank you. Um, you can't go anywhere and yeah, Tom, because we're all very grateful to you and for the work that you do for the lecture. I forgot, I forgot one thing. Asher. <laughs> and his many predecessors, about 10 of you, right? It's me. <laughs> but Asher's really the climax of this So if, if there's any um, grad school applicants in the room who don't know who Tom was, he's the man with the bouquet. Um, <laughs> um, but really, tremendous amounts of work, and it's a commemoration, but um, so much more. And uh, now, um, Vivian Namaste, Research Chair in HIV and Sexual Health. Um, you've been part of choosing the Speakers for Lecture Series for two years, and have been um, an active member of the Concordia community for a long time. So. Please come up and say hi. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so Jordan asked me to talk a little bit about looking forward, about the next 20 years. And so I'm happy to talk a little bit as a researcher. So 
part of the response to the HIV epidemic is about research, right? About the questions we ask, the knowledge we have, the knowledge we don't have. My students will know I'm actually really interested in questions of history. So I'm going to talk about, just briefly, about a couple projects I'm working on or I'm interested in working on and hopefully use it as a springboard to help you or help all of us collectively think about the next 20 years. So what does looking back do for us thinking about looking forward? So one project that I'm working on is um, about the history of HIV and trans communities in Paris. For those of you who don't know the trans community in, in Paris, it's actually the community most affected by HIV. So in migrant sex worker communities, up, up to 80% of the girls are HIV positive. So it's a story, it's a fascinating story, right? Where HIV is everywhere, but if you look for the official statistics, there are none, right? There's no official statistics which document that. So my work seeks to actually talk to people and, and document the work that they do, right? So amazing stories where people talk about being expelled from Italy, right? Visas run out, immigration cops at the door, friend is dying of HIV, and they raise funds to collect money for an ambulance so someone can go with this woman dying of HIV to Paris where it's easier to get access to emergency health care if you're HIV positive and where you can get what's called a carte seizure, which is sort of the equivalent of a permanent residency card, right? So this amazing, terrible story, but also incredibly inspiring, right? So part of my work is looking at that. One of the projects I hope to begin working on, my students will recognize this from the fall, is the history of HIV in Haitian communities here in Montreal. I'm deeply concerned with the ways in which we tell a story of the history of this epidemic that affected primarily gay male communities in its early years. And while it absolutely affected gay male communities in its early years, in the context of Montreal, most cases of AIDS until 1986 were in Haitian communities. But we don't know that. We don't talk about that. You can't find an article on that that easily, simply describes that, that gives you the, the, the statistics, the stats on that, right? I wanted to give my students that, right? So part of what I want to do is document that history, right? To then sort of say, you know, what happens when we forget that history? What happens when entire populations get neglected and get forgotten from this epidemic? And I actually want to make a bridge to Diana's talk tonight because I think, you know, what you've given us tonight has been so amazing in terms of the breadth of your work, in terms of your sound political analysis and great sense of humor, right? But also your incredible humility, right? I think you've really like, given us an occasion to think through what did it mean to do HIV prevention way back in 1986, right? And how are the ways in which some of those challenges haven't changed, right? So. I think that's a really kind of nice way that I want to just kind of close is to thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Um You guys can keep going and getting wine and stuff and getting food, but <laughs> the mic's going to be open and I, I want you to... And, and samosas, thank you for the samosas. I want to introduce you to Bruno Le Proud from Jeunesse Landa and Pochette. So, uh, yes, I'm Bruno, I'm a queer activist in Montreal, I've been involved with different youth groups uh, for current friends over 10 years, I've been diagnosed with HIV when I was 19 years old, um, I'm also a sex worker, um, I could continue the list of what I am and what I am not uh, at the same time, but um, when I think of what is the future, uh, looking back at the history, I think for me the HIV AIDS movements have been a really good example of how to reappropriate knowledge and make it a tool to make change. And when I look at, just for example, United in Anger and how they build up solidarity across different people, uh, I feel that in the years after that, we've, there's a, I don't know when exactly, but something changed out and the movement that was created out been kind of recuperated or I don't know when the right wing's politics have just got in there and a bit not destroyed everything, but recuperate at least the strong edge of that movement. And right now I feel the big challenges of HIV prevention and is to look back at how politics is affecting 
sexuality and like how love and sexuality are being uh, tangled together on sex works, on HIV, on homosexuality. Uh, I was at a conference on LGBT refugees this morning and well, Vivian was presenting and it was really, really interesting to see how bisexuals uh, claimant were often rejected because of their, uh, they couldn't prove that they were the right narrative of sexuality, they wouldn't fit in the like homosexual coming out narrative. And the two other presenters too were just um, telling how in fact we've created out this narrative of coming out as a way of it gets better afterwards and it's not exactly how they were framing it but I don't know how to frame it in English pretty quickly, but make me think of epistemology of closet from Sedwig, and that was written in the 90s and felt like so present right now uh, in the, today. Uh, one of my primary works, in fact, I've been working on uh, this historical, maybe I can talk about some project that I'm still trying to make it, I'll do it quickly. Uh, this historical walking tour of the gay village, uh, trying to bring back how, even if though there's a pink tourism that tried to promote everything in everyone to come to Montreal. There's still a lot of unknown uh, sex tourism being done also there, that's always not being said, uh, sex places. A lot of like criminality still going on, uh, working also on this project that will show on the 27th. We'll, we'll bring back to Nathan and Edgar, but before that we've created out a project called Video Queer um, with a small video called How to Create a Flash Mob, if I'm right. And it was to bring tools to people to like help themselves uh, continue the movement and think critically about what is going on and be heard because that's the thing, there's a lot of oppressions uh, that silence people and we should be yeah. <laughs> Wow, that was, that was brutal. Brutal of me to ask you to say so much in so little time that you can go to radicalqueersomen.com and find out about the video that Bruno made with Radical Queers Men, um, which is screening on March 27th. And uh, you can go to p10.qc.ca if you want to find out about Projet Dis that works with queer youth. Um, next up, we have Nora Butler Burke from the Action Santé Travesti Transsexuel de Quebec. Um, go right ahead. Hi, it's uh, nice to be here tonight. Um, so, uh, I work at uh, Aztec, um, an organization in the Centre Sud that's been around uh, since, uh, or actually a project of Cactus Montreal that's been around since the late 90s. Um, and in thinking about the next 20 years, um, you know, I, I think it's actually interesting to look just yesterday what happened in the House of Commons. Um, a bill was passed. Um, I see people nodding their heads around uh, recognition of trans human rights and um, uh, gender identity in the Human Rights Code. And I think that um, that's an unfortunate reflection of a future to come and a future that already exists in terms of human rights as a framework for liberation and for justice. And I don't think that we will achieve the things that we have been striving for and fighting for for so many years if we follow down this path. And maybe I'm jumping to a lot of conclusions already, but through my work at Aztec, I've worked with people who will never be able to stand up to an employer, will never be able to take the police to, uh, to court, or very rarely uh, when they have been violated in their workplace, when they have been beaten and imprisoned and told that you are going to die of AIDS. And seeing a celebration of this kind of encoding of uh, legal rights for the people that I work with. And I'm like, is this real? Is this really going to make a difference? Uh, is this very state that uh, enforces and acts, creates the conditions uh, within which people are dying actually going to realize true justice? True justice. And so I think we need to think about who also are leading our movements, who are the people who are most directly impacted by these laws, neglected by these laws, tossed aside, left to die, and where are they in the past 20 years? Where have they been? And where are they going to be situated in the work to come? And so in working at Aztec, being an activist and learning so much over my past five years of work, I think that it's incredibly important that we incorporate racial and economic justice into our movements. I know that there's been a lot of work that has been done already in the AIDS response uh, that center these principles and that center the leadership. And I wanna, I wanna see the women who I know who are in their 20s, who are sex workers, who are on the streets, who are migrants, who are HIV positive, leading this work. 
Those are the people who need to be on the front lines and supporting, and with their support, they need, there needs to be support, but it needs to be a critical, conscious effort to ensure that we do not fail. Because there's been so much failure also in the AIDS response, the more that we get uh, recuperated by bureaucrats, uh, by the government, by the state. And so we need to figure out how to resist in a way that truly honors the people who are, you know, really on the front lines and not here on the front lines, not in my position in the job where I work on the front lines, but people who are, who are out there working right now. Uh, and, and that is what I see for the next 20 years. Thank you, Noah. I also need to add that um, Aztec recently produced a phenomenal um, trans health um, outreach tool and, and health pamphlet um, that there's many ways to get involved. I think with Aztec and helping them promote their work and looking at the many issues Noah brought up. Um, uh, ensuite, un grand ami à moi, Alexis Moussengagna, um, directeur général de Arc-en-Ciel d'Afrique the executive director of Arc-en-Ciel d'Afrique and representing the Massy Mardi Festival. If you can intervene in the language of your choice, my dear, so I give you the mic. Hi, my name is Alexis Moussangania. Today I'm dressed as a man, but that's not my dress of every day. Uh, it was for a special moment because I had to pass at TV5 for like African um, program that was being screened and I thought that if I dress as a girl like the way I am, uh, it was going to change kind of message. So yeah, I present Arkansas South Africa, African Rainbow, an organization that tackles the reality of gay, black living here. As you can see, I'm black. As you can see, I'm gay. <laughs> and that is, uh, you know, we talk about the Black History Month, that's in February. And we talk about the Gay Pride, that is uh, August. But there's nothing in between. And when somebody is in between, uh, it's very complicated because in a black community, they will tell me, no, go to gay community. And the gay community will say, no, go to black community. Wow. So where are we? We are kind of tongue, tongue, and we are a minority in a minority, but you have to do the double work yeah. to be visible in the black community and to be visible in the gay community. Yeah. Talking about being tongue apart, uh, last week I got a letter from Sake, that is uh, from the program to help organizations that are doing Defense des Droits. And they said that in our letter patent, we have a, a, an object, a name, that we are fighting against, against HIV and AIDS. And they said that's health, it's not uh, right. Oh. So, and because of that, we have been rejected. Oh my 10 God. years of work, how many farms did we get? Zero mm. from the government. Mm. Because we are the minority in the minority, even though we do the double work, mm. we are not seen. And if I go to the health minister, they will say, okay, you are doing the rights and uh, you are making the community visible, that we can't uh, fund you. So they are asking us to choose. How can I choose when there's HIV and AIDS that are affecting my community? We know that the black community is affected. We know that gay community is affected. That means we are doubly affected. Yeah. But they tell me, choose. Wow. What would be my choice? I can't choose. Choosing is like dividing myself. Yeah. It's dividing my organization. And it's dividing the less uh, opportunity that we have. So really, that's the, the thing that we are facing as a double minority, double discriminated, and doubly affected. The answer, you can come to Concordia if you don't fit in anywhere else. <laughs> no, really. Um, but you can really go get more wine if you want. Um, we have very another, every, that's for everybody. Um, and if you want to find out more about Massi Madi, it's an amazing festival, a wonderful organization, and they're looking at starting an HIV committee there. And Alexa is a, a joy to work with no matter what she wears. So, moi. 
Um, we have a special guest, um, Jessica Whitbread from the International Council of Women Living with HIV and AIDS Action Now. Um, I have no qualms about cutting her off after three minutes, so I'm going to get something to drink now. something and 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 then I didn't know it was actually like gonna be a big thing or see all these people on and anyway um yeah I thought I was supposed to talk about when I first was diagnosed and then uh similarly to Jordan I well I took the class and then every Thursday I believe it was Thursday night sitting in that room and going home and crying but but I'm gonna talk about happy things because that's what it's supposed to be about. so um yeah where does the AIDS movement go from here. Um, I think one of the things is that it's a pretty like somber kind of tone in the movement. And one of the things for me is that like, you know, I already got it. I'm already here and doing it. And we talk a lot about prevention, but what if you're living it, you know? And that's something we don't talk about. And I don't want to talk about how much it sucks because it does. But sometimes like I do a lot of fun things. And I mm -hmm. want to continue to do fun things, mm -hmm. like that all of you do, do drugs, make out, have parties. Take off your pants on Saturday at Il Matore. I'm going to get to that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So, so I guess like, so it's, I'm in a really interesting and unique position right now. I've been recently elected to be the, the global chair of the International <laughs> Community of Women Living with HIV. <laughs> I know, I know. I met Stephen Lewis recently and I was like, hi, I'm in the chair of ICW. And he was like, as if, you know? Because <laughs> I'm the youngest and the first queer woman. So I think that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I want to shake things up, like going to these meetings that are pointless and kind of stupid, actually. But, you know, <laughs> they are, they're a waste of money, you know? Um, yeah, so basically some of the things that I think is, I think like grassroots activism is something that's, you know, we need to push forward for and, and do and how can we like keep fires burning. Um, so I do a lot of work with AIDS Action Now and this is where I get to plug things. So using art and plug, activism plug, plug. and we have a workshop on Saturday. I don't know the location, but yeah. you want to talk about it? Yeah, you can go to we can do it together. RadicalQuizMen.com. It's 1407 Valois in Darkest Toshalaga at noon on Saturday, <laughs> the 23rd, the same day as No Pants, No Problem. <laughs> which is at 11 p.m. at El Matari. Yeah, right. yeah. And the thing is, if you come to the workshop and you're like, oh, I went to one of those workshops and then I just did this like poster and then no one's going to see it, that's a lie. Because all your posters, we're going to stick them all up at Il Matore and, and everyone can see it and it'll be super fun. Thank yeah. you, Jessica. You're a very hard act to follow. <laughs> um, the person, the, the person um, employed by the um, AIDS Industrial Complex is now going to speak, but um, we love, Johnny Forever is also a member of the Seo Sandika, a group of HIV and AIDS concerned people in Montreal that I'm also part of. Johnny's going to speak briefly about an awesome project at ACCM. And if anyone wants to talk um, to me or Johnny about the Seo Sandika, um, we're both members of this group and we're both also going to be at the poster making workshop on Saturday. And I think anyone who's come here as well for um, Projet 10, Aztec, their own accord, Matsi Madi. Um, I want to thank all of you, and I'm assuming you're here because you don't mind people coming up and offering things like translation and graphic design skills and Ooh. all of the things that they need. Johnny Forever. Thanks, Jordan. I guess also echoing a couple of things that I heard Nora talk about, just continuing critical thinking, and while we're um, thinking about people that are on the front lines and thinking about myself as someone who is employed, as Jordan said, by the States Industrial Complex. <laughs> Gonna be brief. And in thinking about the future, two projects happening at AIDS Community Care Montreal that is commemorating its 25th year right now are a youth group, ACCM Plus, um, and so it's going to include anything from you know support groups to a, a drop-in center. 
and then hopefully with uh, ways to electronically connect um, nationally and internationally with other youth groups uh, for positive youth and currently building um, kind of a steering committee to shape the, the practical as well as the political direction of the project. Um, of, uh, so looking for, for positive people, um, 29 years of age and under, to join that up. Um, I guess I'll have flyers and put them perhaps here. Yeah, <laughs> Once that happens, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Johnny Crab, everybody. Get out the flyers. And so you can go to that website again, Johnny's gonna be, I think, called